I want to uh, thank uh, Comrade Jesse for that introduction. And I would like to uh, express uh, a profound appreciation to the African People's Solidarity Committee uh, for not only uh, conducting this really important plenary that's happening on the day, but also for the work that you do all the time. I also uh, would like to uh, say that some years ago, uh, after having founded the African People's Solidarity Committee right here in this city, um, in 1976, um, initially, the organization and organizers uh, within the, uh, the African People's Solidarity Committee did not appear uh, to represent and what it is that we were trying to do with, as the African People's Socialist uh, Party. Uh, it was a, a difficult uh, struggle because all of us uh, um, walk uh, carrying a lot of baggage uh, from uh, our past and, and uh, from the experiences that, uh, that we uh, have in life. And trying to build the African uh, People's Solidarity Committee was hard. Uh, some of you may uh, know that in 1966, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which at that time uh, was, I believe, the leading, most dynamic uh, force uh, within the so-called civil rights movement and was the bridge uh, in this country at the moment uh, from the civil rights movement to the actual uh, anti-colonial black liberation movement in this country. In 1966, the civil rights movement uh, ex uh, SNCC expelled uh, the white members uh, of the organization and telling them that you should go back to the white community that's the source of all the contradictions, all the problems, all the so-called racism, we want you to go there. And it was because the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee became conscious uh, in its own uh, efforts that the struggle of African people was for self-determination. That, in fact, uh, the struggle of Africans in this country was part and parcel of the struggle against colonialism and imperialist domination being experienced uh, by all over the world. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, for example, was the first uh, significant organization in this country that came out in solidarity with the struggle of the Palestinians. Uh, it was the first organization in this country that came out in opposition to the war in Vietnam. It was the organization that originated the slogan, hell no, we won't go. Uh, it was, uh, uh, as you know, also the organization that ultimately uh, put forth a slogan demand of black power, that to what it is that we have to have is power in the hands of African people. It asked the members of the white organizers to leave because there were, uh, there are this relationship that exists uh, in the world and in this country between Africans and, and white people. Uh, that meant that white people in the organization uh, had uh, all of the expertise. Uh, if someone, they were the only ones who knew how to type because they were the only one who had uh, education uh, in this uh, country, had that kind of experience. Uh, they also uh, had the benefit of a certain kind of relationship with the imperialist state that uh, blinded them uh, in so many ways to the real contradictions being experienced. For example, there were situations uh, in deep Mississippi, uh, places like this, where in, to show their defiance of the white uh, reactionary traditions, of, of young white women would uh, in public grab the hands of white men to, uh, and walk down the street to say, you know, how dare you say that we can't do this? And of course, the white young man would die uh, as a consequence of that because of the different kind of relationship that uh, whites and uh, Africans have uh, to this country, to this social system. These are material relationships that we're talking about. So the struggle of Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, was confronted with, uh, was one of how, having come to the conclusion that our struggle is for national liberation. How do we liberate uh, not only the African people in general, but how do we liberate the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee so that it can play a major role uh, in this process? 
And it concluded that what was fundamental was that the struggle had to be led by African people ourselves, uh, and that uh, in terms of the struggle for self-reliance and that genuine support from whites meant that whites should go back to the community that was visiting this, raining this violence and terror onto our communities. And of course what happened was, instead of doing that, the whites who were members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, experienced great pain uh, and rejection and uh, uh, did not uh, do that. And in fact, that's when they began to discover the, the seriousness of the Vietnam struggle and they initiated uh, movements that uh, uh, fought against the wars, etc. that was in Vietnam, while the war that was happening still uh, within the United States and in Mississippi and other places like that, uh, they left behind. They took with them their expertise, their money, their resources, etc., and as a, and their connections, uh, I might say, uh, their parents and their cousins and their friends and their white skin that made them more believable, and the struggles that they were involved that they thought the most important, most acceptable to white people, and uh, so it diverted uh, a lot of resources and attention away from the struggle for national liberation. As, as much as we supported, and we did support the struggle of Viet, the Vietnamese people. In fact, at some time later, the Vietnamese were able to say that one of the great inspirations that they had uh, uh, in terms of uh, tactics involved against the U.S. in Vietnam was what they learned from the African Revolution fighting against the imperialists right here in this country. And anybody with any eyes to see uh, recognize that what made it difficult for the United States to stay in Vietnam and kill people in Da Nang was because they had to fight in, in Detroit and throughout the United States against the black revolution in this country. Uh, but that was a difficult thing uh, for, for the whites who were friends of the African revolution uh, at that juncture to uh, understand in terms of when the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee asked them to do that, and they didn't. And so, uh, and again, it, it represented a certain relationship that is a material relationship that exists in this country and in the world between white people and the rest of the world, which is part of what makes uh, what we've been experiencing with the African People Solidarity Committee so significant. And in 1976, when we called together the first meeting, to build uh, the African People's Solidarity Committee, uh, a meeting that included uh, many people whom we had known for a long period of time because they had expressed friendship uh, with the African People's Socialist Party and even predecessor organization, uh, the Junta of Militant Organizations, JOMO. And they existed in places like Kentucky and Alabama and they were in Maine and, uh, out, and various other places, Georgia, throughout the United States. Uh, and they came and participated uh, right here in this city in building the African People Solidarity Committee. And we had uh, uh, at least a weekend long uh, conference uh, where we had a lot of discussion, laid out a lot of plans, but by the time uh, after the conference was over, most of the people got back to their homes. I started getting phone calls right away from people who had changed their minds, uh, that they didn't really think that this is what they wanted to do. And that was understandable because what seemed to be solidarity up to now, up to that point, was things like we saw with the so-called Native American Solidarity Movement and uh, to uh, some extent what we saw with the Puerto Rican Solidarity movement, things like that, where the Native American Solidarity Movement thought they were doing solidarity because they were learning how, and this was a literal statement that, uh, that I got you know, from people doing that work, they were learning how to weave uh, uh, Indian baskets, and somehow this was a statement of solidarity, etc. So uh, it was really difficult what we were trying to do with the question of solidarity. We had seen uh, uh, in the 1960s uh, North Americans or white people who said they were in solidarity with the struggle of oppressed people. We had seen uh, them uh, express solidarity with people in Vietnam and we had seen uh, them 
declare that they were in solidarity with African people who uh, were in Southwest Africa, uh, now called Namibia. They were actually buying printing presses and sending them to Namibia. And they were doing this in some instances from Oakland, California, where the Black Panther Party was headquartered. And I actually visited them. I walked to them, I went into their office and said, look, we engaged in a critically significant struggle. The Federal Bureau of Investigation has declared that this struggle as expressed to the Black Panther Party represents the greatest internal threat to the security of the United States since the Civil War. You've got to support us. If you can give a, a printing press and put it together to send it in Namibia, you can do something similar to support a revolution, a black revolution right here in this country. And they couldn't see that. They couldn't do that. They wouldn't do that. They didn't support us at all. And so there was a kind of, uh, uh, there was a culture that was already here. Uh, that was informed by the material relationships that we have uh, with each other uh, to such an, a point, uh, such an extent that many in the black liberation movement at the time had counted white people completely out of it. Uh, that the response that we got from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, I guess, was, uh, was helped to, to do that, but people had come up with uh, explanations uh, declaring white people genetic uh, uh, mutations, abnormal forces that could not be relied on to, to do anything and everything that was happening in the white world did seem to support the suggestion that white people are not like the rest of us. In fact, white people are not like the rest of us. Uh, and, and so this was something that we had to contend with in trying to build the African People's Solidarity Com uh, Committee in the, from the beginning left us with this, uh, with a bad taste in our mouths, to the point that we almost concluded that we're not going to be able to get what it is that we're looking for, that white people are willing to be charitable, willing to do charity kind of stuff, you know, based on their own terms, but not what we are trying to do. We don't need charity. We need a relationship with allies uh, to build a revolutionary movement to overturn a social system that is responsible for all the misery that the people on this earth are, 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 are experiencing. That's what we need. And uh, so, but it looked for a while we were not going to get that. Say, so, okay, we need the damn mimeograph machine anyway. We just take the mimeograph machine, you know. Uh, and then on, on, on one night, I got this, this phone call, or one day, from Comrade Penny Hess, uh, who uh, by now had moved to Oakland, California, and she said, uh, look, I'm being evicted from the collective, because at that time, we often, a uh, movement, people lived in collectives. Uh, I'm being evicted from the, from, the, uh, from the collective. They're kicking me out. And they're kicking me out because of this, and then she told me why. And then what she told me allowed me for the first time since the inception of the African People's Solidarity Committee to hear coming from the mouth of somebody in that movement, in that committee, an understanding, a genuine understanding of what the hell it was that we were trying to do. And when we got that, then we said, don't worry about it, and we engaged the, the, the committee into a certain kind of struggle that helped to rescue the African People's Solidarity Committee from the fate that we've seen much of what called itself the white left uh, and there have been other struggles since then, but I just want to say that was, in my view, a really important moment in the development of the African People's Solidarity Committee. On today, the presentation that I just heard by Comrade Penny Hess, I believe represents another such moment that we, that we have been looking for. <laughs> because for a very long time, the Solidarity Committee has been capable of talking about the immorality, trying to define the morality of, of the North American population, white people, European, trying to reshape that definition and speaking to white people on the terms of morality. It's often talking about righting an historical wrong saying to the white community, we don't want to, we don't want to carry this horrible burden that's been on our backs in terms of from the, from the emergence of the so-called white population. Some, from the emergence of what I heard a comrade refer to as the political class that we call white people. We don't want to carry that, that burden with us. We want to, 
turn the page on that kind of relationship. That's, that's something that APSC has always been able to do and always talked about. Uh, and in our discussions over the last period of time, we've talked about the science. Okay, we talked about that point. That's really important. But science, let's get to the scientific, let's get to the scientific essence of the question. Because whether somebody wants to be moral or immoral is going to be based on an actual recognition of relationships in the world. Because slavery was moral from the perspective of the people who were engaged in slavery. They didn't see themselves as monsters or people who were immoral in general. Any more than an undertaker sees himself as immoral because he needs people to die and is happy for people to die so that he can get some business. He doesn't see himself as being immoral. So the question was not so much morality in that way, except that we had to establish a scientific foundation upon which our understanding of morality has to rest. That's what I heard on today. When we talk about today, parasitism, the origin of a social system itself, which doesn't mean that everybody's going to be one to it. Of course not. Because there are a lot of people who want transformation, who want change, that won't make them uncomfortable. And you're talking about, the fact is, you know it's true, when we live in a world where most of the people live off less than $10 a day, where 80% of the people on the planet Earth live off less than $10 a day. The European nation, white people, white consciousness, white culture, came into being as a part of the process of creating that reality and it rests upon that reality and its sense of morality, good and bad, is based on what the stability of that particular reality. It is. And so, that's why I thought this was such a really important and significant presentation that we just heard. Because we talk now about the science of it. And if you understand the science of it, ultimately, you will come to understand that it is an untenable relationship. It won't work. There are not enough drones in the world to keep it secure. And yes, the beginning, the attack on the earth didn't change, just begin. And I want people to be clear about this. The attack on the earth didn't just begin. You can only assume the attack on the earth and the environment just began if you subtract uh, abstract human beings from nature. But at the moment you recognize that human beings are a part of nature, then you understand that again that the inception, the creation of the white man was the beginning of the attack on the earth itself. That's what was stated in this, when I say the white man, because the white man has not always existed any more than Europe has always existed. They all both came into existence as a consequence of slavery and colonialism, of what Karl Marx referred to as the primitive accumulation of capital, but what we recognize as simply a parasitic attachment on the body of humanity by Europe that represents itself as capitalism in the world today. Anyway. So I wanted to, to really express my appreciation for what I really I think is a, just a magnificent presentation yes. that Comrade uh, Penny Hess yes. made here uh, a moment ago. What a profoundly important presentation and an important moment in history because something is happening in the world today and I think we're going to say a few things about this that makes a certain understanding uh, inevitable, that makes it necessary for all of us to have to confront a reality different from what it is that we've assumed uh, for the last five or six hundred years. Something is happening. So in this conference on today, the African People Solidarity Committee, which is an organization of the African People's Socialist Party, which itself is an organization that uh, is more than 40 years old, and I'm, you know, that's something that is astounding given the history of repression and terror of the United States against uh, organizations that have struggled uh, to overturn uh, uh, this oppression that we experience as a people. Most of us, in terms of recognizing and understanding something about the history of struggle in this country, 
relate a lot to the existence of the Black Panther Party. Uh, but most of us are not familiar that as incredible as that existence was, that you know, the Black Panther Party, its revolutionary existence was only about three years. Because this government destroyed it. Uh, and in fact, uh, the guy, I think his name was John Mitchell, who at one juncture was the, the Attorney General of the United States, had declared that uh, by the end of the year, the Black Panther Party, I think he said by the end of the 1969, the Black Panther Party would be destroyed. He didn't say that they were going to commit crimes. He didn't say that because they are this and that. He said they would be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And of course, on December 4th, 1969, we remember what, that Fred Hampton was murdered in his sleep uh, by uh, the, the uh, police department of Chicago with the aid and assistance of the United States government and the form of the FBI. We have, uh, we are experiencing a, an extraordinary important uh, point in time. We saw a whole revolutionary movement crushed uh, by the imperialists. Uh, we are talking about now a crisis of imperialism. It's not the first crisis that we've seen. We're talking about a crisis of capitalism. It's not the first crisis that we've seen. I'm hoping that, that what we've heard up to now uh, helps us to understand that any, any so-called Indian uprising was an attack on capitalism. That any, any of the, the, the indigenous people here in the Americas who rose up and stabbed and killed a white baby, cut the throat of white uh, uh, intruders who were trying to take their land and resources was a fight against capitalism. I think it's necessary to say that because there's some assumption that there was the good Indians and bad Indians and, and uh, those who uh, treated the white people well and didn't treat the white people well. The fact is, all of them, uh, most of them from the beginning, did treat white people well. That's why white people were able to live for any moment of time here. But the fact is that the land was usurped and horrible acts of brutality created against the people to steal every bit of the land. It's not like there were so many white people came to this country that there was not even enough land for everybody once they got here. It didn't matter. They killed all, killed everybody. Destroyed the buffalo, which was an act of war, which was a form of warfare to destroy the economy of the indigenous people so that they would starve or be brought into submission. So any act of resistance, anyone who rose up to kill white people, white women, white babies, white people, period, were a fight against capitalism. That was capitalism in this process of coming into existence. That was a crisis of capitalism when they said, call the cavalry. Any act of Nat Turner when he said, he said, he said, strike at night and spare no one. That was an attack against capitalism. And I think it's really important to understand that because there's a way that we have begun to uh, abstract certain uh, reality and certain events in history uh, in a fashion that will not allow us to see the whole picture. We are talking about capitalism that everybody in this room say that they are opposed to in some way or another. We are talking about capitalism that is responsible for ruin. Uh, around the rest of the world and how it came into being, which is really important for us to understand. Because even as we stand here today, this country and Europe are at war against most of the people on earth. They are moving armies and drones and satellites and missiles and things like that to kill people who they have convinced some people in this country are enemies. It's all right to raid a country and to overthrow the government and lynch his president because Saddam Hussein was a bad person. You've heard it. He was a bad person. He oppressed his own people when it's our job to do that. <laughs> and, and this kind of garbage in, in this, is something that is found. How can you find that acceptable? How can you find how everybody else on earth lives acceptable? And of course, one way is found acceptable because through this process of butchery 
slavery, brigandage, colonialism, the emergence of an ideology that people refer to as racism, which is simply the ideological underpinning of a capitalist social system itself that allows white people to abstract themselves from the rest of humanity and, and say that, yeah, make it possible to see all the brutality around in, in the rest of the world and for it to be okay because after all, they are less civilized, less human, etc. Because whiteness becomes the template for what is civilized, what is good, what is beautiful, what is everything else. This is an ideological question that we are talking about. This thing that we call racism is nothing but a cover for imperialism. It is the thing that arms white people in their brains to make white people accomplices to every grotesque act of brutality that happens around the world except when it happens in Newtown, yes, yes. Connecticut. Yes. Makes it even possible to see, to know. We talked about maybe two billion people almost over a 200 year period of time who were killed, murdered, butchered in India Civilized, genteel, tea sipping. England did that. Right? We're talking about, we don't know how many hundreds of millions of African people in Africa and in the process of being brought from Africa throughout the Americas and then killed once in the Americas. How many died? How many of the indigenous peoples here died? And all the people who participated in almost every instance in any critical and significant ways are heroic figures according to the law of Europe and North America. Heroic figures. Even so-called progressives and leftists in this country tell us that a problem that we have today is because we don't have the America of Jefferson. You've heard it said. People take, quote, Jefferson in a minute. He says that that every society needs to be hallowed, the seed of freedom has to, be, has to be watered every so often with the blood of tyrants. Which, who in the hell was he talking of? This man, who not only was a slave owner, but was a, a vicious pedophile on top of it. A man who, who, who raped the 13 year old child, Sally Hemings, and had babies by her who genteel white America, and particularly southern white America, denied was real for so long because this real heroic democratic figure that they're talking about. And then when DNA proved it, what they then began to do was to refer to it as an affair. How in the hell can a slave master have an affair with a slave? How, you know, what's she going to say? Not tonight, honey, I got a headache? It doesn't work like that. And, but there's a consciousness that is born of this relationship. This thing that we refer to as racism. And racism is a very dirty and, and, and harmful concept. Because once you're struggling against racism as it's characterized, the only thing you're doing is talking about finding a way to be accepted in a social system based on murder and terror of the rest of the peoples of the world. You've united with a concept, race, which itself was born through the consequence of slavery and colonialism. There's no such thing as race. Colonialism, and let me tell you this, I am an American. Don't want to make anybody, don't want to leave that unclear in anybody's mind. I am un American. I am un everything. I'm against everything America stands for and has ever stood for. America is a cancer on this earth that has to be rooted out. But this is a really important conference. 
Again, I believe it's a conference happening at a critical time in the development of this whole revolutionary process in the world. And it's happening at a time where the African People's Socialist Party ourselves uh, going through incredibly important struggle, changes. And the African People's Solidarity Committee as an organization of the party is playing a fundamental role in this process. We call it the One People, One Party, One Destiny campaign. And in many ways, it is a campaign that is designed to carry out the mandate of our Fifth Congress, where we laid out a lot of things that had to happen. And I want to say that as important as the things that have already been said are, and that will be said for the duration of this conference on today, I know that it's not something that will win everybody. Uh, I know that you have to believe, uh, first of all, that we are talking about a social system that does exist, that there, you can actually understand the system, that we are not talking about uh, people living in conditions that were imposed on them by some, some uh, external force, some gods, some place, uh, by people not having good luck or uh, a bad crop of uh, ganja, uh, marijuana. Uh, there is a way to understand this world. It's not because you got a, a good leader and that George Bush was not smart and Barack Obama, who, Barack Hussein Obama is smart. It's got nothing to do with that. Or that George Bush uh, was a white man and Barack Obama is an African. It's got nothing to do with that. Uh, that there is a social system itself and it can be understood. And the relationship that human beings enjoy in this, on this earth can be understood. If you can't get with that, if you can't unite with that, then there's a lot of what we would say from this forth on that you will not be able to unite with as well. You just won't be able to do it. You, some of you will leave here still waiting for Jesus to come back and fix everything. <laughs> or for some other kinds of solutions. We want to change the hearts of people. You know that. We want to change their hearts, you know, etc. And uh, some, will, some will leave us. So if you cannot understand and believe that we are talking about a particular social system that had a beginning, that it was not something that was bestowed upon humanity by some external force, but it has a beginning, we can, we can find it out, we can look at it, we can talk about it. That's why Karl Marx was just quoted, and one of the reasons I like Marx. Uh, Comrade Penny Hess like to refer to him as cold and clinical. That doesn't bother me at all. Doesn't bother me at all. I, that's one of the things that I like. That, that you can, it's, it forces us to look at this particular question in a very scientific, cold, cold way. That this system can be understood. And so uh, Marx takes a stab at understanding it. He may not understand it completely, but the method that he used is something everybody can use. It's this it's methods that was really developed by Marx and Engels, etc., that I use to disprove a lot of what Marx had to, to say. The method is great, it's wonderful, which is, uh, uh, it's, it's, and I think that's really important for us to, to get to so that we can understand what the hell is happening in the world. Because we'll never get out of this fix if we don't recognize that there is a way to understand it scientifically. You don't have to wait for Martin Luther King to come back and have another dream. There's a way that you can understand it scientifically. And that's the struggle. That's one of the most important struggles that we're involved in at this time. To bring the science of society back into the discussion itself. So it's not based on the goodwill or good wishes of anybody. Whether it's the president of this country or that country, or whether it's the leader of this organization or that organization, including myself. In fact, one of the things that I hope I do well is help people to understand how I came to the conclusions that I came to, so you can check them for yourself. See, that's what Comrade Penny Hess's presentation was about. You can go, you, what she said, everything, you can go and check it out. 
You don't even have to go any place. In fact, you can you you've heard it in many different ways in many different times. You just haven't got the right analysis or the summation from it, but you've heard it. This is what makes it help, helpful. You know we're dealing with science because it's falsifiable. It, theories abound. All kinds of theories, but they're not all scientific. But theory that is falsifiable is what you want to work with. If somebody say that, uh, says to us that uh, uh, the reason uh, everybody is having all these problems in the world is because uh, Adam ate from the tree of knowledge and uh, that's it. No, how the hell do you falsify that? I mean, there's no way that you can, you can, you know, there's no way in hell. Maybe if you can find where Adam was buried, <laughs> some remains, do some kind of DNA stuff and see if there's anything of a tree of knowledge in the DNA. <laughs> You know, uh, maybe you can find out something, but it's not something that you can find out. But here's what we said. We said, like Marx, that the origin of this social system is in slavery, colonialism, brigandage, what the British and all of these people did. And you know it's true. Because all you got to do is look at the world and you see that the only place where people are doing well in the world generally speaking, is in Europe, North America, most of the white world, and other people who've cut into the action, and every place else, people catching hell. Every place, that, whether that's India, whether that's Africa, whether that's Asia, all the rest of the people are catching hell. It's falsifiable. Did the stuff that she just talked about, did it actually happen? Did Adam actually eat the apple? Hell, I don't even know if there was an Adam. <laughs> See, so, so that's what makes it profoundly important. And the question that we are grappling with now is whether we find the situation we're living with so unsatisfactory that we want to really do something to uproot it, to get rid of the damn system, or are we just trying to find a way, as what Comrade Hess was talking about earlier, to make it easier to live in this system. We can fight against racism. Well, hell, if all the white people in the country and in the world woke up tomorrow and say again how much they love me and that doesn't do anything to actually change the damn conditions that I'm living in I'm not sure that I need to love like Tina Turner said what's love got to do with it <laughs> if all the white people in the world said okay uh, when Negroes go to the bank tomorrow you're going to have a pretty decent bank account, you're going to have nice housing, and etc. And then still say that I'm to be a part of a social system that's bleeding Haiti, that's bleeding Africa, that's murdering people in Afghanistan, Iraq, etc. That's supposed to be something that's acceptable to me? And will the system do anything it can to buy off portions of a population in order to unite them as a part of a process of making war against the rest of the world? Hell yes it will. In fact, the European nation itself, the white man, if you will, was consolidated as a part of a process to separate white people from the rest of the people who had to be oppressed and to win the unity in the process of doing that. What do you think all of a sudden? Uh, you think that Barack Obama and imperialism loves homosexuals now? They say you can have same-sex marriage no, part of it is a process of humiliation for against the rest of the world. So these are internal contradictions. Solve these contradictions exist among white people so that white people are more capable of fighting against the niggers and the chinks and the rest of the people around the world. That's what it's about. It's a social system defending itself. Uniting in order to do that. Of course it is. So, we've organized One People, One Party, One Destiny campaign because this is the critical historical moment that we're looking at. We've seen resistance to capitalism since its inception. Believe it or not, the vast majority of the people in the world do not have the same opinion about capitalism, imperialism, Europe, Europeans, and white people than white people, capitalists, and imperialists have of yourselves. Most of us don't have the same opinion. 
Most of us did not volunteer to make Europe and North America and white people rich at our expense. The two billion so-called Indians, uh, so Indians did not commit suicide. They were murdered. The Africa itself that is now uh, carved up into untenable entities uh, was not done voluntarily. You can't find an instance where the Africans got together and say, hey, let's carve this up and create Ghana, this up and create Sudan. Let's send a whole lot of the people out uh, to a slave uh, in Haiti and all these other people places. And then let's forget that we send them out there and actually believe that there's such a thing as an African-American or Negro-American or Jamaican or some other nonsense like that. Now that wasn't done by the rest of us. What's happening is the rest of the world, since it's begun, has been in the process of trying to rectify this relationship we have with the capitalism, with imperialism. There's never been a moment when there ha we haven't been fighting against it. Every uprising by the so-called restless natives has been an, an attack on this, this arrangement, this relationship that we have. Every reality, every community around the world uh, uh, lives and experiences uh, imperialism in some way or another. The hatred of women is something that Europe brought with it when it came to Africa, when it came to the Americas, the rest of it. Uh, this is not some black thing, and no matter how many bitches you hear on a rap video, it is not something that we brought from Africa with us, it was something that was imposed on us by a social system that does not have the ability to recognize women or any other people as quality entities on this earth. It's a social system. It may make some white people feel good to think that some, some rapper who just made his first money as a consequence of being able to sing and dance, which is what we do for white people, or have done for the longest period of time, just came out of the housing project, which is nothing but a, another kind of concentration camp. This becomes the spokesperson for the African community this becomes the poster child for the oppression of women, please. But nobody in this room believes in any nonsense like that. But this campaign, because it's a critical moment in history, everybody knows that. Everybody knows something is going on here. And it's not just the, it's not the so-called fiscal cliff. What damn fiscal cliff? What fiscal cliff? We, we've suffered something like a Grand Canyon. <laughs> We're in the bottom of it. It's been there for the longest period of time. They're talking about a fiscal cliff. When, when did the fiscal cliff get here? We live in a, a, a country in the talks about America where, where Africans have 22% have less income. And white people have 22 times rather more, more, more uh, assets than Africans. When did the cliff get here? Right. When did the cliff get here that's responsible for Africans? Yeah. Having a, a lifespan seven years less than white people. When did the damn cliff get here? What kind of cliff is it? Was it, was it the fiscal cliff that we were looking at when it was decided that we build all these prisons in the rural white communities? of this country to try to revitalize the community by stuffing Africans into it? Was, were we looking at the fiscal cliff then? So, so we're talking about a serious kind of crisis that, that they're covering up with the discussion about fiscal cliffs. Nothing but a false contradiction. Nothing but an artificial contradiction of a social system based on a parasitic relationship to the rest of the world not being able to satisfy the aspirations and interests of the people who it usually takes care of. Somebody says that the problem is financial capital. I heard that. The problem they have is financial capital because <coughs> capitalism is developed to this and that. <laughs> well, hell yeah, the capitalists, the financial capitalists are bad guys. But hell, before there was anything called financial capitalist, uh, capitalism, the rest of us were catching hell from America. 
I'm not going to be a party to any attempt in the year 2013 to describe the reality that the vast majority of the people of the world are experiencing based on the experiences and needs and requirements of Europe, white people, and America. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. What is happening, though, is that resistance is becoming generalized throughout the whole world. That's why disturbance, upheaval, everywhere in the world. The vast majority of this disturbance and upheaval is a consequence of an offensive against capitalism as imperialism as we know it. The vast majority. Some of this upheaval is a consequence of the imperialists themselves creating upheaval in order to try to, to undermine the consequences of the upheaval of the mass of the people. It's an instance of, of I understand, a technique they're using fighting forest fires where you start fire to stop, keep a fire from reaching its consequences. You understand? That's what, what it is that we're looking at. So we, we say that something really fundamental is happening here. We've seen resistance in this country. We've seen it in the world. We've seen people uh, since the inception, again, fighting against this system. But now something different is happening. It's generalized. It's everywhere. And not only that, we see that the major entity, the fundamental uh, uh, linchpin of the whole rotten social system itself is experiencing, experiencing severe crisis. You know it's experiencing crisis. The election, the selection of Barack Hussein Obama is evidence of crisis. What in the hell has happened in America, comrades? What in the hell has happened in this country, comrades? Comrades, what in the hell has happened in America that would let you assume that there's been such a fundamental social change that they will put a goddamn Negro in the president of the United States of America? What in the hell has happened? How in the hell can, and this is some liberals love this because liberals can say, well, I support black people because I voted for Barack Hussein Obama. Wow, done my job. Isn't that something? Has that been some transformation? Did I wake up? What the hell? Something happened when I went to sleep last night that changed the conditions of Africans in this country around the world? Hell no. And you know it. In fact, since his election, you see more outrageous attacks on African people because his ass is there. And we are saying that his selection by white power is a consequence, a statement of severe, the severity of the crisis. When I say the severity of the crisis, I am recognizing, as everybody in this room, if you're honest, will recognize that imperialism has defined African people in such a bestial way that there is no way in hell, even in this city right here, the profound con con uh, contradiction crisis that had Clinton send a member of his cabinet when he was president to this city because it looked like black people might be getting some power through resistance. Had tanks brought into this city. You're going to tell me that they're going to put this Negro in power when they can't even stand a police chief in the city of St. Petersburg who says that the problem we have is not that we need more police control, but we need economic development for black people? When the city of St. Petersburg couldn't even tolerate that, you're saying that they put a Negro, the ruling class, with a Negro in the White House? It's a crisis of imperialism. It's another instance of what we used to see in the 1960s when the masses of African people would rise up in resistance. And all throughout our communities you had these stores and shops that were owned by white people. Every shop in the community owned by white people. The liquor store owned by white people. The stores that sold clothing owned by white people. And when the rebellion happened, the first targets, the Africans started burning them down. And then what happens? The white people get a Negro 
to run the store. And then they print on the window, soul brother, on the window. They keep the Africans from burning it down. That's all they've done in Washington, D.C. They put a Negro to run the business and wrote on the building, soul brother. But I'm telling you, they can't stop this resistance with that Negro. And, and the objective is to confuse people. <clears throat> Neocolonialism is old. It's not new. And for a while, it will confuse people. We've seen it happen before. Wilson Good in Philadelphia. Black male dropped the bomb on an African community. Destroyed more than 60 some odd houses. Killed 11 men, and men women, and children uh, in the process of doing that. And uh, confused the whole African community. Because Wilson Good got elected as a consequence of this community coming together to deal with the racists in the form of Rizzo who was a terrorist chief of police, a terrorist <coughs> mayor uh, before them. So all the Africans got together and they elected Wilson Good. But guess what? Same system was there. And the system had the same enemies then that it had, that it had when Rizzo was there. And guess what the enemies were? In this instance, they call themselves by the name Africa. And it's the Move Family Africa that got bombed uh, by Wilson Good. And so it's the same system. It doesn't matter. It's the same rotten, foul social system. So we got a crisis here of this whole system because they're, they're having to try to deal on every front, every place you look. You can't open up a newspaper, go to your internet, turn on a television without seeing some crisis in every place on earth. Not just in, in places like Afghanistan and Iraq and, and places like Palestine, but in Greece. Who are complaining, where the people are complaining that you're treating us like third world countries. <laughs> my, my goodness. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> treating us like the Negroes. You know? And... Uh, uh, all over Europe, the crisis of imperialism, everywhere, the crisis is there. And this offers us a splendid opportunity. And the crisis is caused by the fact, what we've talked about before, that the whole capitalist system rests upon an edif edifice of parasitism. This parasitic relationship. The, the things that fed the children of Greece. The, the, the process that fed the white people in America and the rest of the world. Now people are fighting to take their resources back. Hugo Chavez uh, saying that we're taking the oil and move to unite all of South America uh, in a way that people are taking their resources back. That's the crisis. The crisis is you can't stop the people in the Middle East from fighting for their resources back. They're not necessarily conscious revolutionaries or anything. They've just been put in a situation that they will either fight or they will die under the, under the consequence that imperialism has imposed on them. So the resistance is generalized now. It's generalized in, in, in there are other contradictions which are profound responding to and relating to this resistance. Demographic changes in the world where the majority of countries in Europe are not even producing enough White people to reproduce the population. White women in Germany, the only place in the white world where women are having enough babies to reproduce the population is Iceland. That sounds helpful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, this is leading to a, a frantic kind of contradictions. They're talking about the immigration question throughout Europe. Europe is, is really in a bad place. That's why some people are now referring it to as Eurabia, uh, because they don't put, they're not producing enough people to, to, to be part of the workforce. So they're bringing the workforce from Arab countries and other places, but when they come, they come as Arabs and they come as Muslims. They do not come as French, etc. So you got to get rid of them. This is the immigration question. And if you know anything about chauvinistic France, it's reactionary that live 
sucking the blood of Africans in Haiti, sucking the blood now of Africans all on the continent of Africa, braggadocia about this culture that was stolen from Egypt and from the rest of the world, you know, this braggadocia, this, this chauvinistic France, and now you got all these Muslims, nobody, so you're going to change it by saying that the women can't wear headscarves. Or people can't practice their religion and what have you. They gotta act white, be white. You're gonna make this whole struggle throughout the world to create the good Muslims, the Uncle Tom Muslim, the sellout Muslim, the so-called non, what do they call it? Uh, what do they call it? Fundamentalist Muslims. But everybody's the fundamentalist today, and that's the contradiction that you gotta deal with. Fundamentally opposed to imperialism. Fundamentally opposed to this relationship. I want to say a couple of things, and I've only been I warned so late that I've only got a few minutes left. So late. This, they're struggling really hard to make the Iranians uh, comply, to be act right, and things like that. And I don't know what kind of success they're going to have there. They're struggling. They, 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 uh, they, uh, you know, to the extent they have any religious belief, they're praying that Hugo Chavez will die, uh, that the poison or whatever they use is working. Uh, you know, they, they, they are, you know, doing that kind of thing. And, and, but there's an objective reality that's happening that shakes up imperialism as we know it. Part of what's shaking up imperialism as we know it also is the growth and influence of China, which is a hungry, it's a hungry capitalism. It's a hungry imperialism. It's rapacious. It's all over Africa. It's challenging U.S. hegemony in the Pacific uh, Asian Pacific Basin region, etc. It's responsible for deploying all kinds of troops in Australia and doing all kinds of uh, stuff in that area, creating new coalitions for the imperialists to try to, <clears throat> to maintain uh, that situation. All of that is happening. Imperialism, as we know it, will not survive this. It doesn't mean that it's going to lead to like the revolutionary consequences that we're looking for. We've seen in the past struggles for national liberation that have occurred all over the world. You look all over Africa, you see the consequence of national liberation so-called struggles. But that's just part of the struggle that we're involved in, which is what makes the African People Socialist Party, all of its component parts, including the African People Solidarity Committee, so important. Because the objective has to be more than simply winning independence. The question is, beyond that, what kind of society are we going to have? Are we going to have a society based on equality and real justice, which means an attack on the social system itself, on the nature, on capitalism, which was born out of imperialism and not the other way around, which is really important for us to understand because it was imperialism that gave birth to white people, white power, Europe, and capitalism. It was what they did to India, Africa, what they did to the Americas and the rest of it that created. That was imperial imperialism that created capitalism, which is really important for us to understand. And so that's one of the reasons what we do is so important, because the outcome cannot simply be independence. The outcome has to be a revolutionary process leading to socialism, has to be a socialist outcome. So that the people who produce value and wealth are the collective owners of this value and wealth. So that we don't, we're not trying to create another uh, class of folk, uh, replace it with a Negro class of explorers and oppressors. We are talking about a different kind of social system altogether, which makes the existence of the African People's Socialist Party so important which makes our presence not just in America important, but our presence throughout Europe and in the Caribbean and in Africa and in Canada uh, so important. Because our objective is to win a revolutionary process that will overturn a foul, rotten social system that has no redeeming qualities at all. It's got to go. And as the system itself, not just to change the face, but to change the system, uproot it from humanity. This is where we have a splendid opportunity. This is what is so fundamentally different also about the discussion that we're having today because the mass of people on earth are now participating in driving events, defining reality in a way that white people and everybody else 
in some way or another, we'll have to deal with it and have to recognize it. One other thing, that I am the chair of the African Socialist International, and part of this remarkable organization and leaders are people like Alex Morley and Charles Walker uh, in the Bahamas who lead our work to build a revolution throughout the Caribbean. Uh, they are people like uh, Vanessa Thompson in Frankfurt, Germany, young African woman who leads all of our work uh, to build the party throughout Europe and has done a splendid job. You've heard some discussion about the kind of work that she's been involved in. A comrades like Brother Wabusa, uh, who is leading our work uh, to take the African Socialist International and the party into Congo. Uh, comrades uh, 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 like Luese Kinshasa, who is right now based in London, England, magnificent leader who is uh, responsible for heading up all the work of our party to build the African Socialist International throughout the world. Comrades, uh, like uh, the one who has been mentioned, uh, Secretary General of the African People's Socialist Party of the United States, Gaida Cambon, a veteran uh, uh, in our party, in our movement uh, with a, a reputation uh, that uh, uh, is untimed. Comrades uh, like Chimarenga Wall, uh, who heads up the national, uh, the party's uh, office of recruitment and membership, who has been a soldier in this party since he was 17, and he is more than 17 now. Uh, <laughs> uh, comrades uh, like Rich Piatrahita, uh, who heads up the party's work in the Northeast region of the United States, and. Dia Ulubala, who leads the International People's Democratic uh, Uhuru Movement uh, and is helping to build our organization not only uh, throughout this country but in Europe and in Africa, doing a magnificent job. Comrades uh, like Ona Zene Ishatel, who has actually uh, set a new standard uh, for uh, how our work uh, is to be conducted and has created uh, an incredible office dealing with economic development and finance. Uh, uh, these are uh, like the magnificent uh, leaders of our party. And uh, I want you to know that some of them have been mentioned. They, we work not only uh, here uh, in this city and in this country, but throughout the world. This is part of what makes the African People's Socialist Party so significant because we are an international organization, because we are everywhere. This is the thing that for finally gives the African Revolution a uh, uniform uh, 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 understanding of uh, the reality that we face in the world and uh, uh, tactics and strategy that can be generalized everywhere. So it's not just in this case that there's struggle happening in Angola that we might support or struggle happening in this place that we might support. We, our objective is to be all of those places and we are becoming a part of all those places. This is the, the, the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party, which is based on democratic centralism. That is to say, our party, we have conferences and congresses and events like this <clears throat> to give everybody in the party, in the movement, all of our members an, or, an opportunity to struggle around the issues and questions and policies that's going to inform what it is that we're going to do. And then the party requires, demands, the most stringent, the most rigid a kind of discipline in carrying it out. Because we are not like the mafia where you join uh, and if you try to get out, we're going to shoot you in the kneecap or something like that. We are not like a Christian religion where if you don't believe that uh, you're going to be, uh, have to face eternal damnation and burning the fires of hell forever. No. People come uh, into this movement, into this party, based on voluntary unity.
unity, I unite, I believe in what it is that we stand for. We just exercise the democratic process and say, this is what we're going to do. And having done that, then I bestow on the leadership of this movement the responsibility to drive what it is that I said that I believe in doing in the first place. That's who we are. And everybody can do this. And we don't require everybody to do this, but it's a tough job. It's a hard job. It means getting rid of a lot of the damn baggage that we have come into this whole situation with. Imperialism has informed us, and one of the biggest struggles that we're involved in is the struggle against self. The struggle against self that's been imposed on us by imperialism. That has taught us how to think. That has taught us what to believe. That has taught us even how to, how to experience the rest of the world. Everybody knows sugar is bad. Everybody eats it any damn way. Because imperialism has taught that and drives it to us and gives us reminder every day of our lives that you need to get your sugar hit. And so the reality is that we're looking for a different kind of world. And to make this different kind of world, it's going to take a different kind of people. A people who have to some extent been able to free ourselves uh, ideologically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically from the, from the, from the grasp of imperialism. And to the extent that we have not freed ourselves from it, to be open and willing to work with our comrades and brothers and sisters who will help us in not only to make the struggle against imperialism on the outside, but to make the struggle against us on the inside. Because all of us come here with the attitudes and ideas of imperialism, with the same kind of arrogance uh, that imperialism, with the same, same fear of uh, of uh, more than anything of, of uh, being wrong. <laughs> the inability to do genuine self-criticism because it means if I say I'm self-critical about something that something wrong with me, I'm not as good as somebody else. Imperialism imposes that kind of nonsense on us. And that's part of what we have to overturn. We have to develop the willingness to work as hard for freedom, for liberation as we work for our own selves. And you know how to, what kind of work we're able to do for ourselves. Even when we sometimes trick and convince ourselves we're doing it for the others. You know, often it's for us that we're doing it. We have to learn how to free ourselves from that. So the African People's Socialist Party, the National Central Committee, the leadership of the African Socialist International is the leadership of this whole movement. Everything we do is my leadership. It's the leadership of the African People's Solidarity Committee. It's democratic centralist principles. The, 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 the majority, uh, the minority subordinate to the majority. The, 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 uh, the whole organization subordinate to the Congress uh, and to the Central Committee. And the law uh, organization subordinate to the higher organizations. People say that you got that kind of organization that make you automatons. And what they mean is, <laughs> they say, we know you automatons cause if I ask you uh, a question uh, uh, in the Bahamas, I get the same answer that I get when I ask you a question in Oakland, California. See, damn right you do. That's what you call unity of action and unity of will. You got a united organization because imperialism ain't nothing to play with. And if you're playing, you're in the wreaks, wrong place. It ain't nothing. It, it wreaks devastation havoc around the world. And we are looking forward to a period where we don't have to have this kind of organization. We're looking forward to a period where we can, like, like some unthinking uh, people will be able, or even the wealthy, be able to walk out and what a wonderful and beautiful day and experience that beautiful day on its own terms. We're looking forward for that. But when we walk out here in the paradise, I've heard white people refer to St. Petersburg, this is paradise. When we walk out here to the paradise of St. Petersburg, we are people conscious of the fact that imperialism is slaughtering people not only around the world, but right here in this damn community on a regular basis. Everybody here should be offended to the max that we got prison system bursting at the scene with African people who will never know a future if imperialism is allowed to stand. That every damn African in the prison system needs to be cut loose and the prison system needs to be destroyed. It ain't even really complicated. So, this is the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party, some of which I just mentioned. And it's a democratic centrist 
process that we engaged in. And I mention this in part because we are employing the One People, One Party, One Destiny campaign, which means that we've temporarily begun to use an ad hoc structure to our party, our movement. Because I, I want all the work now to carry out the mandate that the Congress decided on uh, at our fifth Congress. I want to use every resource that we've got in the party accessible to the party to make that happen. So that means that African People's Solidarity Committee and people who are in, in the uh, Uhura Solidarity Movement, etc., they're working now in places that they've never worked in terms of the structures of the party itself. And uh, in some ways you can see, you can say that it looks like we might have replicated the old SNCC thing once again. Remember SNCC had to ask the white people to get out because we got a lot of talent and expertise in the solidarity movement. And it can lead to the same kind of consciousness. Uh, it can lead to the same kind of consciousness that the white people, because you come with a certain kind of expertise, can really misunderstand what the hell this relationship is all about. What the hell it is that we're trying to do. Don't mistake that. What is happening is that one of the things that makes the African People's Solidarity Committee one of the things so important is that despite this objective material reality relationship that whites in Europe have to the rest of the world, you've been able to see a future and unite with it beyond your own selfish interests. And they are narrow and selfish if you're white. I don't care how much you like yourself and your mama and believe that you know, uh, you should go to heaven when you die. What an extraordinary thing for, what a courageous stance for you in the African People's Solidarity Committee. Going against the grain, all your parents and all your neighbors and everybody who said the stuff, and I remember all the nasty stuff that they used to say, they don't say it as much anymore, when the Solidarity Committee was just white lesbians working under the leadership of black men. You know? <clears throat> it's a courageous stance. But it's a stance that changed the face of the movement in this country. Because we have redefined what this relationship should be. And what the relationship should be can be found in the existence of the African People's Solidarity Committee. <laughs> the other thing that is significant about the African People's Solidarity Committee is that you do work under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party, the African Socialist International, which is a revolutionary organization that has an objective to destroy everything that white people have thought was important up to now. The reality is every wish, every hope for happiness, every dream, every anticipation for your children that you have is a dream, a hope, an anticipation that rests upon the foundation of the misery of every goddamn body else. That dream has to be ended. That dream has to be ended. What, what is happening is that an opportunity for North Americans, Europeans, white people to join a relationship with everybody on the world. You are the vanguard in the African People Solidarity Committee to make that happen. It ain't gonna happen easily. But you are the examples that all the other North Americans, all the other Europeans need to show that it is possible. And that's the struggle that we're involved in. So I want to salute the leadership of the African People's Solidarity Committee, Commandante Penny Hess. <laughs> Central Committee and the Political Bureau of the African People's Solidarity Committee. All the soldiers and trailblazers associated with this organization, the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, the other solidarity forces, the volunteers, everybody who has united with this forward trajectory, recognizing that True progress in this world that we live in is being determined by the struggles of the oppressed peoples around the world to end this kind of relationship and build a new world. I want to thank all of you. I want to thank also the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party, the African Socialist International, 
Because I know that it's upon your shoulders that I stand the rank and file of the party, all of the components of our movement who work to put out a newspaper every month, who work to build economic institutions of self-reliance, who are struggling to solve the problem that has confronted every revolutionary movement for national liberation since its very beginning, and that is to have an actual foundation and capacity to govern, to administer a state once the revolution has been won. This is the process that we've been involved in, and I thank you so much, everybody, for participating in this process with us. Uhuru.